The band that I have now reminds me of the sincerity and the dedication of my original band. Mike Randall, Dave Daddy O'Green, Rusty Squeezebox, and David Chappell. To me, it seems like it was, uh, they were like heaven sent because they're such dedicated, they're so dedicated to my work. They know all the words, Rusty. He helps me a great deal because the songs uh, Forever Changes were 35 years ago, you know? And since then I've written tons of songs, but he sort of helps me keep the, the words uh, correct, you know what I mean? First time I met Arthur was uh, at a club called Trancus in Malibu. And uh, I went to go see Arthur play, and he played with a couple members of the Knack. Uh, and, uh, it was a great show, and I actually met Arthur before the show. He was just sitting down, um, and I sat down with him, and we talked a little bit. And uh, I think it wasn't had to be more than a year later that uh, we actually met him again to audition for the band. At, at the time, we had a band called Baby Lemonade, and um, we actually, Rusty and I, slid a, a, a demo tape to Arthur's manager at the time, Tom Sweeney. This is like in what '93, right? Like, like, like uh, the spring of '93, and we said we'd love to open up for you. So we got a uh, we got a phone call a couple weeks later, and we we opened up. Um, I believe it was um, April 26, 1993, at the Troubadour. And uh, after the show, I went up and uh, I went up and shook Arthur's hand, and he actually gave me a hug. He said, "Yeah, man, your group's really good." The next, the next morning, we got a phone call from his manager saying, Arthur was really impressed with you guys. You know, would you guys be interested in being like the new love? And, he, and we said, what about the group you already has? He says, you gotta fire those guys. So um, our drummer, Dave Green, had a, had his garage was kind of converted into like a little studio. And um, so Arthur, you know, drove out. And um, we did about five songs. Like, we did Seven to Seven Is, Sign DC, Alone Again Or, Orange Skies, and like some other song. It was cool. It was uh, Arthur didn't say much. He just he came right in, and it was uh, pretty business, you know. And uh, he just wanted to hear some of the main songs that he was doing. And uh, I I was a big fan for a long time, so I was really able to <clears throat> uh, help the band learn the songs. Like I knew them really well inside out. So. Um, I felt pretty confident that we'd, we'd do it well. We didn't know if he liked it or not, because he didn't say it, he just left. Then he called back and he, and he said he liked it. And uh, we've been his main band ever since. I, I'd been a big fan of love in my childhood. <laughs> Let's say childhood. Um, I discovered love by, I bought a, the first Mother's of Invention album at my local record shop and really couldn't get into it. So I. Uh, held it over the oven, warped it, and brought it back to the store, and was thumbing through the racks for my exchange record, and uh, came across this interesting album cover with a bunch of guys sitting on top of this, uh, looked like a burnt out, a uh, bunch of burnt out cinders uh, a chimney. Turns out to be Bela Lugosi's castle, or the mansion that Love lived in, and I discovered Love. I discovered that album and fell in love with it instantly. I had everything that I needed at that particular time for a favorite rock band and little did I know what was going to be following the next couple of albums but uh, that was that was my first encounter with love uh, as, a, as a recording group and and I became a fan then um, many years later uh, I was uh, regularly uh, a part of a, a Jimi Hendrix news group on the internet a lot of people seriously discussing the, the life of Jimi Hendrix um, and uh, we would exchange emails just about every day uh, and I met a lot of people around the world uh, through that. And one guy in particular, a guy by the name of David Fairweather, was a personal friend of Arthur Lee's, and he put me in touch with him. I expressed interest. I said, you know, I would really be interested in, in putting a tour together. Uh, as a preface, I'd been in the music business for, uh, for about 20 years prior to that. But I'd really be interested in putting together a tour for Arthur. I really had no idea that he had been touring in the 90s uh, on and off. Um, he had appeared once in England in 92 um, as part of a creative records festival uh, that Alan McGee put together and had done sporadic dates. 
uh, with a group called Baby Lemonade uh, as of 93. And to make a long story short, Dave put me in touch with him and I uh, spoke to Arthur almost the very next day. And within a week, we were putting together a tour back in 1996, uh, which was really Arthur's triumphant return to England. Little did we know that uh, after that tour, uh, he'd be going to jail. In my book, I quote the Bible, and it starts off with uh, faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. That's what I had with my little five and a half year stay. The belief in God and the belief in my attorney to get me out of the predicament that I was in. And it worked. And this band, they have that same faith in me. So I'm not gonna let them down. And Mr. Kraut definitely has the faith in me because we're nothing alike. You know what I'm saying? We're just nothing alike, but uh, after the gigs, like they go their way and I go my little lonely way. But it's cool, on stage, we're a unit. I got an email from, uh, I believe it was a copy of an email that was sent to me by a fan, actually, that Robert Roselle had sent. And then David Fairweather, at the same time, contacted me again to tell me that Arthur may be getting out early. And the next thing I know, I was on the phone with Arthur's uh, new lawyer who had been uh, fighting to get his um, uh, conviction overturned and writing letters of support to the, to the court in Los Angeles. And it was a process that was going on for about three weeks in December and then ongoing into my vacation in Chile, which I spent virtually at internet cafes in the south of Chile, um, which you can find. Uh, and uh, then Arthur was a free man. And Really, almost immediately, um, we started putting it back together, uh, what was interrupted back in 1996. Arthur was in great spirits, you know, uh, despite what he had gone through for six years, and very motivated to come back again. So we immediately put together a, a, a tour uh, starting in May of uh, 2002. They, uh, Gene had a, a, uh, a guy from Sweden, Gunnar, to uh, arrange all the music. He just listened to the records, basically, and wrote out all the parts. And uh, <clears throat> they had been practicing for a little while. And then one day um, in Stockholm, we just sat in a room and uh, went over everything with acoustic guitars. And uh, it was pretty spot on. We just had to make a few adjustments, and that was it. Yeah, the Gene called me and uh, told me that he's got to manage love. And, uh, well, he asked me to listen to the Forever Changes, and I really liked it. And I sat down with my paper and a pen and headphones and tried to figure out what they did. And now this uh, tour, I've written some new arrangements for songs that didn't have strings on the original album. It's been so great. I love the music and the band. And I brought the <clears throat> eight-piece orchestra from Stockholm, Sweden, with me. I haven't had an orchestra with me in the past and that Forever Changes album requires orchestration. I've looked at the, you know, I've reviewed my own shows with the video, and I found that I was like out of sync with the orchestra. It took a little bit to get used to that orchestra. The voice wasn't going with the music. I was trying to sound more like the record, and uh, it seemed to me like I was just overdoing everything, but now I hope tonight we do one of the better shows of my life because now the orchestra and the band seem like my left and my right arm. I don't want to ever play without an orchestra again. It's, it's fun for me because that's my, one of my favorite parts about the records is all the orchestration and all the parts that we can't do as a five-piece band. And it's just really special and it never gets old. You know, you can just listen to it. And, it's, uh, and plus they're, they're sitting right behind me so I get to hear it the best. So it's great, it sounds like the records, you know. It's, it's fun, it's also, it's a lot of hard work because um, normally when you're just in a band, you know, you can show up at your sound check at five, you leave at six, and you, you don't play till like 10. But we're, we're touring with the whole um, ensemble and the whole crew and everything, so we usually get to, what time we usually get to venues? Uh, two, two, three o'clock. Make sure everything is right. Um, kind of, you know, work with the sound people in the venue with our sound guy and get everything together. And then um, we usually wind up playing for a couple hours. 
and then you know you, you have maybe an hour or two to kill and you got to come back and you play a two hour plus show so you know it's it's a full work day and they'll talk about it and find out yes. And yes. Yes. okay that means that we are nearly ready for the door. let's do seven yeah let's, do, let's get the front of house going all right yeah i, I would just i would just uh, if they would play and the boys i would just call up what's happened <laughs> what hasn't happened um we had a problem with SoundWeb. SoundWeb is the uh, software that that runs the crossovers and, uh, and controls the amps. And um, we had a software problem with that, which we had to overcome. Uh, that was the main problem that kind of delayed us for about an hour and a half. Some more, I think. This tour is, I went from the, I used to say from the cage to the stage and back to the cage. I'm loving going back to the cage this time, you know what I mean? But uh, I did it wrong. I didn't prepare myself really for this tour with all the energy that, that goes on in my show. I went from the couch to the stage and the, all the stuff that I do on stage, the running and the, all the stuff that I do. Uh... Well, I think it's, uh, it's been amazing. It's been kind of overwhelming. Uh, uh, I'm just really glad to be up here playing this music for everybody, and everybody seems to be so appreciative and so happy that it's actually happening. I used to have what they call stage fright. <clears throat> and a guy told me that, Arthur, you know, just pretend like the people are a brick wall, you know, and go on and sing your song and do your thing. Well, that was cool, but now, when you come and see my show, I definitely don't have stage fright. I'm not afraid of any man. <laughs> I'm not afraid of to sing in front of anything. The only thing I want when I see a crowd like the crowd that we play, we packed the house last night in Bristol, I just wanted more people to be there. But if you didn't get the feeling that you were right in my living room, or I was right in your living room, and we were having a good time, you missed out. You understand what I'm saying? I think this time around that they're gonna wake up and smell the roses, it's, it's my turn. Arthur's always been guitar heavy. As his career's gone on, you go from album to album, you see that there's more guitar. So he really, really like pushes me to go more and more and do more. And uh, you know, he wants everybody to express themselves. That's, that's like his main mantra, express yourself. Go up there and be yourself and do your thing. So it's, you know, and in the, in the, in the, in the, the songs are so, um, it's so interesting. You know, they're not just your run-of-the-mill songs, so they're so interesting that they're fun to play. You never really get tired of, of playing them. It changes, but I think right now, I like when we do The Good Humor Man, because uh, that's one of the last songs, or, or that or Old Man. So those are the two pretty much last songs that we uh, had to learn for this tour. And uh, it's just special to hear them, you know. And Arthur didn't sing 
Old Man on the Record. It was actually sung by Brian McLean, and uh, it's nice to hear Arthur do it. Right now, it's Old Man. <laughs> That's my favorite right now. Old Man. I also like Daily Planet a lot, but I'm really, really digging Old Man. I'm trying to make it so that the orchestra doesn't seem to leave the stage and come back and leave the stage and come back, you know? I'm trying to keep it flowing. But uh, it's going to be more laid back this time, you know? I don't know, it's such a warm feeling here in England until it's hard not to become a part of the audience, you know? People love my music and I love the people that love me, man. That's the way it should be. I always wanted to be a musician deep down, I think. Or uh, I was very good in athlete, uh, as an athlete. Uh, so it was either an athlete or, or music. My parents just bent over backwards with me and the music. My father was a construction worker, but, and he really didn't want to hear that noise. My father was a black man, but he didn't even know how to pat his foot to music. My stepfather, Clinton Lee, you know? It was nothing but hard work. He came from a family, his parents died, and uh, he raised 11 brothers and sisters. So he had to work to do that, you know? And I opened my first bank account, uh, picking up Coca-Cola bottles on a job site that he was working on, you know? I had to pick up these bottles to start a bank account. At that time, you could start a bank account with $1, and the Coke bottles were two cents a piece. So I, I guess I got 50 bottles, I opened up a bank account. Make a long story short, I, I couldn't ask for a better set of parents. They were strict and hard, but um, I see, you know, I saw a long time ago that what they were doing was trying to prepare me to be a man in this world that didn't have to go around stealing or robbing or killing people, that I could make an honest living. My mother, Agnes Lee, uh, bought me everything in the world of anything that I wanted to do to be a success in life. God rest her soul. She bought me an accordion first. There was a guy that used to come by with a pony on our street. And uh, he was actually advertising uh, <coughs> accordion lessons for kids to take accordion lessons. My mother bought me an accordion. I took accordion lessons from there. She bought me an organ. I played the organ and the foot pedals and everything. And then um, I was going to a high school assembly and we'd see such people as, uh, Billy Preston went to the same uh, high school I went to, Dorsey High School. And the guy in the fifth dimension, uh, Townsend, he also went to, uh, he was the janitor at, at Dorsey High School. Those guys played Johnny B. Good and with electric guitars and stuff. And it just, it just knocked my socks right off, you know? So I said, wow, man, if I add an organ to their ensemble, maybe we can uh, do something together here. So we formed a band in high school. Johnny Echols, myself, Alan Talbert, Alan Goldstein. And so it was from that, we uh, played in a, in a, so we got the group together, we played in an assembly. We played a song uh, called Last Night by the Marquis. I don't know if Billy Preston went on that uh, first on that gig or if he even played on that gig, but when we played that song last night, the audience from the crowd and the stomping and carrying on, I, I, I think I was playing the right notes, it just moved me so much until it was better than breaking a high school record. It was better than uh, winning first place in the 50-yard dashing junior high school. It was better than anything I've, I never felt anything like that before. And uh, I love to see people having a good time. And these people definitely, these kids were definitely having a good time. 
But my problem was, I had a band, but I didn't have a manager. I didn't exactly, you know, like people run away from home when they're 17 or 18, 16, 17, 18. I didn't run away from home. I drove away from home, you know. My, my father bought me a Corvair Spider when I was 16. And uh, I was ditching classes. I was ditching classes and walking to Capitol Records to get a deal. I walked from Dorsey High School, Farmdale, and Exposition to Hollywood and um, Vine. Um, the Capitol building is right up the street from there. I would go and look at the wall with the people that worked there, and I picked out names from the wall and went up without an invitation or anything and knocked on the doors of these people. I knocked on the doors, you keep knocking, you say, and they say, and someone's gonna eventually let you in. Well, I saw these uh, names on the wall and I picked Adam Ross and Jack Levy. At the time, um, they had a group called uh, the Rivingtons and they had uh, a hit song out in 64, I think it was, called Papa Umau Mau, you know? I spoke from, with them and they decided to uh, take a listen to my band. They took a listen to my band. But for some reason, I didn't trust these guys, you know? Uh, I didn't give them my best material. I gave them my like, second best material because I was totally, uh, I was naive, but I was totally unaware of the business, the music business and things. My parents had to sign for me when I was, what, 16 or something like that. I was underage. And um, from there, we, we did our first uh, uh, a recording. And I was, I was in seventh heaven. I mean, I used to look at uh, uh, 78 records when I was uh, a young boy, and uh, people like Nat King Cole would be on Capitol Records. At that time, it was a, it was a purple uh, label, uh, and the Capitol building was silver or gray. And wow, my, my, my dream came true when I signed with uh, Adam Ross and Jack Levy. Uh, the first record I made on Capitol Records was, was not the best of my ability because I didn't know the business. My parents sure didn't know the business. I didn't have an attorney, so I didn't give the people the best I had. I gave them the second, third, second best that, of the things that I had. And, but I noticed something after we recorded the record. Everything was fine, but the music. The <laughs> I didn't like the music, but there was, there was my name on Capitol Records, you know, and that turned me on more than the music did. But I sort of saw what I could do. So I drifted from there. That the record on uh, the Ninth Wave and Rumble Still Skins didn't, didn't exactly uh, reach the charts, you know what I'm saying? I never got paid a penny for that, as a matter of fact. My first band were like brothers. We were like brothers. <clears throat> we all had a similar uh, behavior pattern, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, we just, kicked it off, man. We were as loose as a goose. The, all of the band members were accomplished musicians. Uh, songs would come to me and uh, I'd relay it to them. And they just, we played in, in, in clubs before uh, I had the name Love. We played in, in clubs. We started off playing in, in, uh, on Melrose in Hollywood. We're making like $15 a night for um, the whole band, you know. A friend of mine had a massage parlor and he also had a, um, a little club, a gay bar or whatever. His name was Alan Franklin. And I asked him one day if we could play at, his, at that club. And we played and the first week dribbles and drabs of people would come in. Uh, Johnny Echoes, Don Conca, um, uh, John Fleckenstein, who later became John Fleck, and myself played at a place called the Brave New World. And uh, we were packing them in and within like 
two weeks, we had like full house, a full house of people. And I used to see this little redhead kid that was uh, <clears throat> hanging around with uh, the birds all the time, you know? His name was Brian McLean. So uh, they had a hit record at the time uh, called Mr. Tambourine Man. And they were playing at a place on uh, Sunset called Cyril's, right? Well, it came time for them to go on a European tour. And they had all these people on the, on the strip that would come and pack Cyril's. You know, like that was the spot in the 60s. Cyril's was like the biggest club on, on the Sunset Strip. And they had all these people. But when they left, the people would hang around outside of that uh, club, Cyril's. But there wasn't a band playing, so I talked to the owner of the club about letting my band play because we were like packing them in at, um, at uh, the Brave New World. We had people, first we started out like 10, 15 people would come and see us play. Then maybe 20 to 30 people would come and see us play. Within three weeks, we had people a queue around the block. We had so many people coming in, we'd have to take intermissions, you know? People like Sal Minio, uh, someone said the Yardbirds, someone said the Rolling Stones, all the different people would come and see us play. I, never, I don't remember seeing the Rolling Stones though, but <clears throat> entertainer after entertainer would come and see us play. And I, I thought that we were really, really gonna be, um, really had a chance at being a success with this music. I used to dance around like these tables. <clears throat> I used to jump from tan table to table playing my guitar playing my harmonica, we were just loose, man. We had, I used to wear one moccasin. A guy gave me one, I gave me, a, um, I thought he was gonna give me a set of moccasins, Scotty, James Scott. I thought he was gonna give me a set of moccasins, he gave me one moccasin and it clicked in my head. Wow, you don't have anybody to promote your idea here. I wore one moccasin for over a year. By the way, we headlined over the Grateful Dead, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Moby Grape, oh shh. Man, when we started out, we were, we moved the hippie movement to San Francisco. That's right, I started it. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, the feeling that I had in the 60s towards the people as a whole were, people were just like, I see people like on The Simpsons or whatever, they uh, satire the name love. But if you live the life that I did, if I didn't have it, and you had it, you gave it to me. If I had it and you didn't have it, I gave it to you. What is that called, sharing? I never had such a, a wonderful experience as I had in 1965, 1966, and so on. <laughs> it was really quite a trip, but I was determined. And my walk from uh, Darcy High School to Capitol Records, I was determined to be an entertainer and a good one, a star, you know what I mean? That's, that's, that was my thing.